Hello, and welcome to episode number 394 of the Armin Show podcast, Science, People, Creativity, Learning More, Expanding the Framework. The show continues to blossom. Panels, groups, solo episodes, live streams on the way. Subscribe if you haven't. Support on YouTube, Spotify, wherever it might be. Apple, leave a review, all those things. Whatever happens on those lines is supportive to the show. On this one here, coming from the UK, a wonderful location. I have been to Scotland. We have... Dr. Helen Natal. I will give the biography, but Helen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm, I'm very glad to have you on. As a description, you are a lecturer in cognitive neuroscience and a BBSRC, new investigator in the Department of Psychology at Lancaster University in the UK. You lead the Neuroscience of Speech and Action Laboratory, NOSA, the NOSA Lab, investigating things about speech, action, cognitive function, how it's represented in the brain, how these work in health and disease, and how they're affected by the aging process. And you use various systems, stimulation, EEG, MRI, EMG, to study these items. That's quite cool. Long live the brain. To me, it's the most interesting thing on the planet because of how much we can do, what we figure out. If I look at a rock for a long time, nothing's going to change too much, but we are altering things left and right. Absolutely. What got you into this category of interest in the first place? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess when I was at college, so in the UK, college is sort of after high school, so you were 10, sort of 16 to 18 years old. I was studying biology as one of my college subjects, and we studied the structure and function of the nervous system. And I learned about how neurons kind of communicate together um, and a little bit about how the brain worked. And I thought, wow, that is cool because like you said, it underlies everything that we are doing as a species, the brain is behind everything um, if you reduce it down to biology. So I felt really excited about following up on some of those um, concepts that I learned about in, in college and pursuing that at university. My career actually took a somewhat non-linear trajectory because I also at the same time had an um, immense kind of love and interest in language. Um, and perhaps you've come across this in some of my research, the two interests have intersected over time. So I actually went on to pursue a degree in linguistics and English literature, which does not concern psychology or neuroscience um, or touches upon it very minimally. However, once I'd finished that degree, I still felt I had an unmet um, need to understand more about how the various things I'd learned about in my degree, in this case, linguistics and speech, were represented at the level of the brain. So I sought to try and undertake graduate training in neuroscience, specifically in the realm of speech and linguistics or hearing was another way that I thought could um, relate to these interests. And I was fortunate enough to um, be sponsored to pursue some postgraduate um, courses. So I took a master's in cognitive neuroscience and neuroimaging. And then that followed, uh, following from that was a PhD in auditory cognitive neuroscience, um, which was funded by the Medical Research Council here in the UK. So yeah, a non-linear trajectory, um, but I, I wouldn't change it. Um, so that's a long answer to your question about how I got interested in it, but it's the answer. We value answers with depth here because good. depth is the key. Good, good. In all facets of existence. And they say how you do one thing is how you do anything. So that's a good sign in general because that means depth across all the domains. We're here to get, you know, in full in some categories, because if we touch on a lot of things very lightly, then there was no, those, like, it, it flutters away in the wind. But Absolutely. if something of depth, it's almost like a plant in the ground. It's it not is. moving when the wind shows up. That's a very nice way of putting it. I see things that way in a nonlinear fashion as well. We are both mm -hmm. nonlinear in such a fashion. <laughs> cool. That's cool. Long live nonlinearity. I even think about that in terms of sounds, like nonlinear sounds that are very, they have a poignant impact on animals or us because like a person screaming and it has like a nonlinear sound represents, oh, that's a real danger. Some real threat is happening versus a normal mm -hmm. sound doesn't have that. Yeah. Now, linguistics and speech, that made me think of something actually. I've known a speech language pathologist. Um, speech is said to be one of the things that differentiates us heavily from other animals, our ability to organize our thoughts and collect through speech. 
how much do you think of speech as important to humans and our, uh, let's say, advanced nature in some regards? I think it's incredibly important. I would agree, agree with that um, speech language pathologist that you spoke to because speech allows us to express the ideas, the thoughts, the creative moments that we have inside of our brain without kind of verbal expression. Um, it wouldn't be possible to communicate in the same way that you know we can do with verbal expression. So it's incredibly integral to yeah to us as humans. Really important. Mm -hmm. They do a thing where they like break down sentences and break down the there's like the finals on those tests have a lot of breakdowns of verbs and nouns and what's this yes. part and what's that. Yes, yes, I covered some of that when I did linguistics. You have to break everything down to like the smallest unit possible. It's like a phylogenetic tree of yes sentence. That's cool. Now, your research, how would you describe the current breadth of your research and the main categories of interest? What's the towards what? So I think um, the bio that you read is is really current and really up to date and reflects the, the main research priorities that I'm focusing on at the moment. So the, the vast majority of the research that I'm doing is age related at the moment. Um, we are doing some other studies which are just in younger adults, but they are also to try and understand how various processes work in younger adult brains so we can then move that knowledge into older adults. So generally the work that we're doing is either in older adults or in some way to benefit our understanding of older adults. And it's very much around how our senses work together. So I'm particularly interested in the sense of hearing. Um, because that's really important for how we speak and also has huge impacts on the brain. So people think about hearing as something like just your ear is doing. Um, and maybe it's not really associated in a lot of people's minds with the workings, the inner workings of the brain. But there's a very, very close link. Of course, we need our brains to understand everything that we perceive through our senses, including sound. But also hearing loss is something that's incredibly common in older age. So over 70% of adults who are aged 70 and above will have a degree of hearing loss. And what's really important is that hearing loss has been identified as a key risk factor in then developing dementia in later life. But you can modify that risk by, for example, seeking help through a hearing aid, which will restore the ability um, for you to hear. Now, the big problem is that people will often spend, say, 10 years living with a medium degree of hearing loss before they will then seek out some help. So the brain for 10 years has been living in this situation where it's not been receiving full input through, through the ears and into the auditory brain areas. So because of that, it's then having to bring in other brain areas and other brain networks to try and provide support to these hearing systems that aren't fully working so people can continue to understand and communicate because the information that's being received in the auditory brain areas is missing. It's fragmented, if you like, because it hasn't been fully detected by the ears. So the brain has to work really hard to fill in the blanks. So hearing is very important to me and understanding how age-related hearing loss affects the brain is really important understanding how the brain's sort of cognitive profile changes in aging is also very important. So many people are aware, for example, um, as you age, your short-term memory skills aren't quite as sharp as perhaps they were when you were younger. You might struggle to find the name for words sometimes. You, you, you almost can you can think of words that are related to the word you're looking for, but you can't find the exact word to name like an object or a TV show that you watched the other day when you're trying to discuss it with a friend. So those types of word finding difficulties are um, very common as we age, very normal and very common. And trying to understand what we can do to ensure that people age healthily and they stay on the right side of healthy aging and the mild side of these cognitive changes. And these cognitive changes don't then transition to dementia, um, that's also really important to me. So understanding how we can age healthily because lifespan is increasing. We're living longer as a race, but health span, the number of healthy years we're having in our later years is not aligning with our lifespan. So how we can ensure that those 
longer years that we're living remain healthy that's that's really important to me so these themes they they intersect and they underpin the the work that I do and they they drive forward the research questions that I seek to answer yeah this makes me think of a few different items at the same time the lifespan and health span I think I will come back to that but first the hearing loss and dementia link mm. is there a when hearing is reduced is it causing or likely to cause more dementia because the individual is not running through normal brain processes? So it's like <clears throat> the brain is tamping yeah, down. Yeah, so that's one possible reason. The exact um, nature of the relationship between hearing loss and dementia is still under active investigation. So people are not fully clear on why there is this relationship. And there's a number of reasons which I'll, I'll talk to you about. So first of all, when the ear is not fully processing the sound, that means a reduced message is being sent up to the auditory brain areas. So because they're, re they're receiving less information, poorer quality information, the areas aren't being used as actively as they would be if the full information was being received. That actually leads to physical changes in the auditory brain areas. They become smaller through atrophy because the amount of information going into them is reduced. Does that kind of make sense? So it's like reduced information going into them leads to them becoming smaller. So I guess if you're at the gym and you know, you start off with really big muscles because you've been working out a lot and then you reduce your weight training and your muscles shrink, the brain physically becomes smaller because there is less going into it. And then as you mentioned, because there's less going into it, um, you're still trying to understand what's happening in conversations. So then other brain areas have to try and help. Brain areas that might be involved in like problem solving, for example, uh, or attention, they're working extra hard to try to assist your auditory brain to recognize the message that you're hearing to understand speech. But the brain does not have infinite resources there's only so kind of much brain there's only so much energy that's going into the brain so if that energy is being diverted towards supporting hearing it means that something else might not be supported so the information um, and the resources are being kind of reallocated if you will and that might be detrimental to other processes there might be other things happening such as if these problem solving brain areas, for example, are being used a lot, that can also become um, damaging to those areas. So like if you over, sorry to use the exercise analogy a lot, but if you overtrain, then that's also kind of detrimental to your performance if you're an athlete. Um, it might be that there is some common link, but that it might not be hearing loss kind of causing dementia and brain decline, but there might be some common age-related reason that underlies dementia and also underlies hearing loss. So it might be a correlation as opposed to one thing causing the other thing. And then there's a separate kind of conversation as well around this, which is this what's called the psychosocial impact of hearing loss. So if you've ever been to um, somewhere where you find it very difficult to hear, it's like a really noisy environment and it's a real struggle to follow the conversation because there's just so much background noise, you might find yourself kind of withdrawing a bit from that conversation because it's so mentally taxing to continue to try to follow it. So for somebody with hearing loss, it would be even more overwhelming. So lots of social settings like cafes or restaurants or pubs or activity centers will have a lot of background noise. If you've got hearing loss, it's very difficult to tolerate those auditory conditions. And that might lead you to stop engaging with those social activities because you find it so mentally draining to try to go in there and understand the speech that you're listening to. If you then stop engaging, you might become more socially isolated if you don't exchange some of those activities for something else. And social isolation is a risk factor for, for cognitive decline in dementia. Um, and we know re relative to so social isolation, challenges to mental well-being like depression, 
then may start to um, happen alongside the social isolation because people experience greater feelings of loneliness and depression together um, because they're not seeking out the same extent of social contact. So it could be that there's that psychosocial side of it that also is involved in why there is this link between hearing loss and dementia. But yeah, it's not well understood and it's a real point of um, interest and requires, you know, considerable research funding to try to get to the bottom of it. It's a very relevant category because that part you just brought up about loneliness and the effects on individuals. I see a lot of material on that. Maybe I'll also come back to that. But also first, the, the brain, how uh, if you're not utilizing certain parts, they may diminish in form. Is there actual percentages of changes of the internal? I always think of the amygdala when I think of brain parts, but is there yeah. actual percentage alterations of portions or is it more, you would see reduced activity, but the regions would still be all the same visibly in size? Yeah, so you see visible reductions. I couldn't tell you a specific percentage of reduction that would happen by a certain age point because it will be different for different people. But first of all, what seems to be the case is it's activity, sorry, brain areas in the temporal cortex, which is where the hearing areas are, they physically diminish in size. So you, if you were to take a brain scan, <coughs> excuse me, from somebody, you might see actual shrinkage of areas within those um, temporal cortex areas because uh, of the lack of auditory input going into the, the hearing areas. And what people are concerned about is that that might then impact other brain areas and potentially lead to atrophy elsewhere. But we need kind of long-term longitudinal studies to really drill down and find data to um, kind of support or oppose some of these hypotheses. But certainly it's evident that in these temporal areas of the brain where the hearing center is, they physically become smaller. Um, with hearing loss in age. Yeah. On the the loneliness point as well, that's a large one. I've seen graphs where it's showcased that that's the highest, most relevant category as far as well-being currently more than if someone quit smoking, uh, reduced drinking, uh, uh, re or reduced their obesity, different factors that you would think are much more important to health, but network and social connectivity, especially for older folks was really substantial as far as representing if they would do well. It said something like having a close friend for maybe an older person or maybe mid-age would be like making another $100,000 a year as far as yeah. the health impacts for that person. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on that? Although it's, it's like slightly a separate category, but thoughts on the effects, social isolation and um, people and what it does. To yeah, the so there's a, there's a really, really good paper in a uh, medical journal called The Lancet by Livingston and colleagues. And there was an update published um, a year or so ago where they tried to map out the exact proportion of risk associated with different um, risk factors, such as you mentioned, like with loneliness. And, and, and this is where the hearing loss risk factor was mentioned. Some of the other risk factors you mentioned have um, also appeared in that paper too. How it kind of relates to, say, making more money, I, I, I couldn't say, but it definitely is very, very important um, and something that we shouldn't overlook. Um, you know, the pandemic, which we are still living with, but the, the acute changes to our social life that were experienced during that time, I think people felt very significantly. Um, and yes, maintaining strong kind of social connections in later life is really, really important for brain health because it keeps you um, mentally stimulated, which is very, very important. Maintaining mental stimulation into your later years is a very, very good way to reduce your risk factor for dementia. Um, so ensuring you've got really good links socially to maintain that mental stimulation is good. Um, and of course, mixing with other humans, we're a social species. It's, it makes you feel good. Um, many of us experienced how virtual interactions felt quite different from, for example, in-person interactions. Um, and there are, there are different kind of um, effects that they have on, on the body and on the brain. So it is very important to be social and to connect with others, definitely. Some people will need that more than others, possibly, but um, 
speaking generally as a you know as a species we do need that social contact mm-hmm. has a substantial impact on our well-being there's book Absolutely. tribes that was about how we're in tribes and such what we like to be yeah now on the category of lifespan and health span mm-hmm. i once had david sinclair i don't know he doesn't have the book i look at my book sometimes to see if it was one of his books but on the show about he had lifespan and uh, he's very hefty into anti-aging efforts and yeah. producing that and then brian johnson is another individual recently who's cataloging every detail of his body so that he keeps everything within a narrow range so it's almost reversing aging according to what he's saying in some categories what um are the most substantial effects of aging on brain and speech processing later in life and is there any way to keep that flat or even improve it in some way yeah so some of the things that i um mentioned at the start are probably the most significant typical changes to the brain so the ability to find a word for example sorry i'm going to cough <coughs> to name an object and um, to find that word and retrieve it from your brain so you can say oh that's the that's the blue tit the bird that's in the tree over there that's a blue tit being able to name something is is crucial and that starts to deteriorate as we age um, short-term memory um, reaction time these are all aspects of what we call cognition being able to do these higher level kind of brain skills if you like and it's normal that these start to change one perspective that exists in the aging literature is that you can build up something called cognitive reserve which may accumulate throughout your lifetime and you build this up by engaging in positive kind of lifestyle activities so it's a bit like building up money in a savings account by engaging in a positive and active lifestyle over the course of your life some researchers believe that that could be paying into a cognitive reserve bank account obviously this is a, a metaphor there's no real bank account in your Where's brain the bank account <laughs> it's in the amygdala that's your favorite part no it's not um there's no, there's no <laughs> secret bank account but the idea is that if you partake in things like exercise, that's incredibly important and one of the most important things I think we can do to be healthy, both in terms of our body and our brain, um, that if you engage in um, social activities, cognitively stimulating activities like uh, learning a musical instrument, learning a language, things that are quite challenging, these types of lifestyle choices um, your education as well, so how much education you engage in prior to 45, these types of lifestyle activities and choices will really help to build up your resilience um, in terms of your brain's cognitive resilience, this reserve idea, so that when you reach that point in your life where you might start to experience adverse changes to the brain, you may be able to tolerate those adverse changes more readily if you've built up extensive cognitive reserve throughout your lifetime relative to somebody who has not built up that same level of cognitive reserve they may find these adverse changes affect them at an earlier point in their later years for example relative to somebody who has high cognitive reserve who might get to a really good age before they notice significant age-related deterioration so there are things like that that we can do um, and should continue to do. There are lots of gaps as well in that literature. It's not clear exactly what is the crucial time point. Like, is there a specific age range where we need to be engaging in these activities? Is there a time point at which it's no longer super beneficial? They are still unknown um, answers. So it's, yeah, there's still a lot to be to be uncovered and to be researched, but this is becoming quite a dominant theory in aging research. And the idea that each one of us has an individual aging trajectory that reflects the choices in the lifestyle we've engaged in um, throughout our life. So taking kind of an individualized, personalized view to aging is going to be really important if we want to try and reduce the incidence of things like dementia and cognitive decline. I'll be depositing all my funds into the amygdala reserve bank account <laughs> shortly. <laughs> I want that to compound interest over time. That would be fabulous. And it's also related to, I wanted to mention, 
I always think of the prefrontal cortex as my mm-hmm. favorite, or one. Yeah, it's like a key part. I'm. I always think of myself as a walking prefrontal cortex because mm-hmm. it's a lot of processing and ability to guide towards things. And then I think of it like you're you're, you're running on sugar, like how much energy you have propels that, and then the brain uses like twenty five percent of mm-hmm. the body's calories. How related is the prefrontal cortex to uh, speech and uh, brain ability, or is it more just like the engine to get it going and it's handled elsewhere? So the, the, Does that the decline front- as well in later life? Yeah, the frontal cortex is really, really important for um, some of these cognitive operations I mentioned. So in the frontal cortex is where you get um, brain activity that seems to underpin a lot of these cognitive abilities that are sensitive to the aging process and really needed for our ability to get through our daily life, like memory and attention and that that type of thing. Um, of course, there are other brain systems that relate to, to those abilities as well. But that kind of ability to problem solve and look at a situation and understand what to do with it is, is very much something which will be um, involving the frontal cortices of the brain. So yeah, you're, you're right. They're a very important part and they communicate with other systems, as I mentioned. So for example, when you asked about speech perception, there are numerous brain systems that are involved and areas in the frontal cortex will help to attach some meaning onto the sounds that you've perceived through your auditory areas, which lie in, in the temporal cortex. So there's there's a huge amount of crosstalk and communication going on around the brain. And areas in the frontal cortex and prefrontal cortex are really vital for yeah, adding some meaning to things and helping us kind of navigate those cognitive challenges um, in day-to-day life. The brain you have described as it having high plasticity and I've seen plasticity as a very important topic for the brain because it's so mm-hmm. adaptive. If we were not adaptive, kind of like um, evolution over time, then we would be limited in responding to the moment as it is. And I have a cool recent example. I was doing some handiwork and then we'll call it tweaked a uh, part of my w- one finger and there's a little tingling a little bit. So hopefully that, gets better, but that may uh, solve itself partially on its own over time. Same thing with the brain filling in gaps over time. How readily does it do that? And where does it run into a wall? Like, nope, this is out of my hands. So that's a really interesting question. So neuroplasticity, I guess a lot of people think about that in response to learning or injury. So if we think about learning first, so you may have, you know, really well-functioning brain, no, no kind of damage, but you might be learning a new skill. So one of the first um, papers, there's, there's a couple, there was one about taxi drivers. I don't know whether you, this has kind of reached your knowledge base, but okay. this this was very interesting to, to many, many neuroscientists and was one of the earliest kind of findings, which was this idea that individuals in London have to have to pass a test. They have to acquire the knowledge, um, which is the knowledge that black cab drivers, black taxi drivers in London must acquire in terms of the geograph- geogra- geography of London. Um, and the taxi drivers who passed the knowledge versus those who did not show differences in the hippocampus, which is a region of the brain that's really involved in in memory formation and memory retrieval. So it physically grew, same as we were talking about the hearing area shrinking because there wasn't enough information going in. The opposite happened here, whereas the taxi drivers were learning all this information about the geography of London and the hippocampus grew in size because it accommodated this, um, this learning, this new experience. Similar sort of time, there was a, a really interesting study which was slightly more refined in the methodological approach where um, jugglers were taught to, to juggle a three ball cascade, a simple juggling routine. So all the individuals in the study, they were non-jugglers to begin with. So they didn't already know how to do this. And they had a scan like before they learned how to do the juggling. And then they had another scan when they became really competent at the juggling. And then they stopped the juggling, some time elapsed, they didn't do any further juggling, and they were scanned again for a third time to see what happened. And there were changes in the, the brain areas um, at that second scan point when they become really competent at juggling. Brain areas that were involved in 
processing kind of complex motion patterns appeared to grow in size. Um, and the researchers inferred from this that that must be because of this new experience that the participants were engaging in, which is learning how to juggle and see these three balls moving through the air. And then when the participants finished the juggling kind of task and they didn't carry on practicing, those areas that had grown went, started to go back down to their original size that they were at baseline. So when you asked about the, the limits of what people can do, um, it's not that once you've learned that kind of juggling routine that, you know, that area grows and stays there forever, but it naturally responds to the experiences you're engaging in dynamically. So if you stop juggling, then that will slip, you know, shrink back down to a similar type of size as it was before you learned. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting. And then when it comes to disease, which is the other context, when neuroplasticity is really relevant because that's one of the ways in which we can overcome kind of damage to the brain, then depending on the extent of the brain damage, you know, if there is very, very extensive brain damage from a stroke, the, the ability to regain your abilities in a way that they match your pre-stroke abilities may not be quite as favorable as if there is a smaller amount of damage sustained in the brain from a stroke where it might be possible to regain your abilities in a, quite a similar way to before you had the stroke. So the extent of the damage will relate to the extent of the recovery, but it's very difficult to predict exactly how one person will fare versus another. And because we're all so different, and as I mentioned about the individualized approach to thinking about the brain in the context of our aging trajectory, I suspect that that's also really relevant to how we recover from brain damage too, because those neuroplastic processes and the sort of health and reserve of the brain will be related to the lifestyle choices you've made um, during your earlier years. So that's, I would never like to say, you know, oh, if you have this type of brain damage, then that makes it very, very difficult because it's always um, important to try to engage in different interventions or different therapies that could try to promote neuroplasticity because what might work for one person, there might be a different type of intervention or different type of therapy that might promote positive neuroplastic effects in a different person. But definitely the extent of the damage will relate to the extent of the recovery and what neuroplasticity effects are possible. Yeah. A couple, a few items come to mind there. One of them, I'll come back to the stroke item, but as far as the cab driver example, I remember that because the cab drivers also had some counter response where they were like, oh, you think these maps are going to do what we do? We have this super sense. They was like looking down at anybody who didn't have a great map sense of the whole area. Like they were experts. And we know these side streets that you guys would never know. That's kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah, it There's is. Like a, there's like a world map in their, in their mind. That's some real skill right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like pizza delivery individuals. They have some, they used to have some real sense of the little shortcuts. Yeah, knowing all the best then, shots that, that your satellite navigation system won't necessarily kind of pick up on as a specified route. Right. It's a nice feeling, but there's a little bit of like that counter. The technology is on the way, and usually there's a first response of, well, that can't, and then shortly after, usually there's adjustment, and then the technology definitely has an impact. Yeah. Even recently with like AI material, like that can't write essays. This Oh, it can actually. Wait a minute. That can't. No, wait, actually. It can't. Oh, yeah, that's a hot topic <laughs> right now. <laughs> Chat GPT right. is a hot topic in universities and essay writing. Yeah, everyone's going to have to get with the program there and figure out yeah what to do. Actually, on that, I'll just throw that in there. Does that show up a lot in uh, discussions like how to manage with it or to include it? Or is that like an ongoing theme? With, with yes, an ongoing, it's an ongoing kind of debate that we're having actively um, at universities at the moment, at least in the UK, because thinking about, okay, well, you know, looking more broadly, what is the role of um, chat GPT or technology like that in our future, in the future of the students that we're training, how might they be using it in their future employment? And therefore, how should universities be trying to understand 
what to do with it. Like, sh should it be treated as a plagiarism type offence? Um, or should it be that we rethink what we're doing educationally and try to work alongside it if we think this is going to be a vital tool for our students and their futures? So it's something that's been actively kind of debated and reflected upon and we'll have to figure out kind of, yeah, what, what to do really. It's an interesting time. It's like, I imagine it's like, yeah, when calculators <laughs> became um, commonplace and everyone's like, oh, the students are going to be able to do maths on the calculator as opposed to by hand. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, we have that That's for fun. words. So, yeah. Right. Right. It's basically just we start with numbers and then we, we headed to words and then yeah. the bandwidth, the bandwidth keeps going up a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, news in that. I always have... I've had discussions many times like with uh, Rama Chalapa of Can We Trust mm -hmm. AI mm -hmm. and other uh, artificial intelligence individuals. The category has always been interesting. Fascinating category. And, yeah. um, and then on the concept you brought up stroke, I yeah. once had a person I know, a friend, uh, she had uh, strokes early in life and definitely there's like a pre-version of her and there's a new version of her and she's in her 30s mm -hmm. and it's not exactly the same. There's some real... Uh, cognitive difference, not yeah. as much discernment. <laughs> There's some actual changes. And I once had the uh, neurosurgeon Alan Ropper on the show, which is a wonderful individual. And he knew the condition, Moya Moya, that she had that caused that stroke, which was very, it's a very rare one. I like to bring that up. Sometimes it's good for me to bring up more like, uh, yeah, because I have like uh, linkages of scenarios that come up. Nice um, how often is research connected to like a stroke? Or an injury, or an individual being deaf, versus is it is it much more difficult to have a healthy individual that has no injuries or um, cognitive impairments yeah. to study from? What's so the limitations it, on either? It end? works in in both in both ways. So I'd say, in terms of participant kind of recruitment and availability, clearly there would be um, more access and availability to get people to take part in research who do not have any kind of um, impairment from stroke or who have any hearing loss because, you know, there is just a greater number of those individuals in the world relative to individuals with hearing loss who've, or who've had a stroke. However, that being said, individuals who may have experienced a stroke or who have hearing loss may be very motivated to want to take part in research to find out more about the condition and how to further understanding of the condition. So research definitely takes place in both ways is the kind of the clinical side and the non-clinical side um, and sometimes research kind of combines the two so you compare your group who may have hearing loss to your group who do not have hearing loss to try to understand the, the key differences between the groups and where things start to um, you know diverge in, in terms of profiles of those individuals um, if you're doing research for example with individuals who have brain damage then it's you, you need to be working closely with like hospital facilities to allow patient access, which has different types of challenges in order to kind of get through those various um, pipelines so you can get access to individuals and, and try to find participants for your study. Whereas, say, if you're studying um, young individuals who, who do not have any kind of brain damage, um, who are what might be regarded as, you know, pretty typical, if you believe there is anything typical, um, but historically people have used that word, then on a university campus, you'll find plenty participants who would be fitting the criteria. So there are different kind of challenges to the, to the two different types of, um, yeah, types of clinical versus non-clinical research, but both are incredibly valuable. Um, one needs to understand how the brain works, um, in a non-clinical situation to then understand what the impact of that clinical condition might have. So I think both are, are really valuable and we need to kind of continue to research both in parallel. That makes sense. One thing I wanted to go back to is I know a person who is forgetting things recently, later in life, they're older and it was bugging them because where they would have the thought or the word it's not showing up, and that is probably a disturbing concept. Mm. Is there anything practically that an individual like that can do 
that may assist them along the way, maybe not fix the issue, but mm -hmm. things they can do or to so, uh, like jumpstart. Yeah, so some people um, are quite interested in kind of cognitive training or brain training. Um, you may, might have heard about that various kind of computer systems like the Nintendo. I think there was a, some years back, they had a suite of brain fitness, like brain training games, trying to improve brain function. And they've been marketed like it's a billion dollar um, industry. And it's th there's some aspects of it that are not particularly rigorous in terms of the science and the robustness behind the claims. However, there are protocols and there are studies out there that are trying to create training protocols that are evidence-based, that are very rigorous, that are um, constructed appropriately and tested appropriately. Um, because there are many, many kind of brain fitness apps that you can download or games that you can buy that have not been kind of tested as a research kind of method before then being rolled out to the public. So it's easy to wind up buying something which may have no benefit whatsoever because it just may have been constructed poorly. Um, some individuals recommend that these types of training protocols have certain features. So if you're thinking about what can I do to try and sharpen my skills, then it, it's worth kind of looking into that. Um, now, most of these programs, what you find is you get better on the program itself and your scores go up, but then in life, you might not see that translating quite so clearly to an everyday kind of difference outside of the training protocol. Um, but it it still represents a way to stimulate yourself cognitively because you know, you're engaging these different cognitive systems and you're providing yourself with that cognitive stimulation. So there's, there's still kind of benefits that exercise and also it's quite confidence building. So my dad had a stroke when um, he was just a few years back, which he has recovered pretty well from, but like you say, there's, there's kind of aspects of him that may be a less kind of evident now post-stroke and many people would meet him and say oh you couldn't tell that he's had a stroke but of course if you know that person really well then to you there are differences but he doesn't come across like somebody who has any kind of impairment neurologically anyway when he had his stroke I said maybe you could think about doing some of these brain training things and I I knew that the benefit in real terms might not be huge, but the benefit to kind of self-esteem and your confidence might be quite helpful because if you can see your scores kind of improving, then that makes you feel more confident. And then that, you know, has a positive effect on your self-esteem and maybe that comes together for you and you, you find the process easier as opposed to having a mental block over it, which is something that can happen if you feel quite negative about it. So... So yeah, cognitive training is something could look into doing things that are, of course, more general, but good for us. So physical activity, um, that type of thing, physical activity can promote neuroplasticity. Um, that's not to say that it's going to fix that specific individual or that specific kind of um, ability, but you're giving your brain the best chance to, to, you know, to do its job. So yeah, physical activity is a great one. I like the point that you brought up there. <laughs> Made me think about games are... That's one thing I've never liked about games is that what you just described, they're, they're in their own little loop. And then when you depart from the game, it, your reality is not so altered. Absolutely. So it's almost like you're in your own little loop machine of some form. Yeah. And so if there's a, let's say, a speech program that is just do these crosswords and it will improve, but there's nothing related to what impact. Now you're just yeah. doing a loop of, let's say, crosswords. It's yes. not connected to reality. Correct. That's where the disconnect. <clears throat> but then the yeah. point you bring up with your dad is a cool one, or others where, or I know individual plays, let's say chess or other things, that might be their way to get the ball rolling a little bit or mm -hmm. get them like, okay, okay, I'm good. And then go yeah. back to reality, even though the disconnect is there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that what you describe about that loop in psychology, it's called near transfer versus far transfer. So the holy grail is that you're going to see some far transfer to the, you know, the wider universe. Whereas what happens is often you see near transfer, so you get better at the task. 
you might get better at a very similar type of computer app or game, but in reality, there's no appreciable improvement. So the idea is that before these apps and games are rolled out to kind of mass markets, that they should be tested for near transfer and far transfer before you can really claim a benefit of this app that exists outside of the games that you're just purely playing within the app itself. So numerous companies have fallen foul of some of these issues and some companies have been called predatory as a result of it because as we've discussed, aging is a a real kind of query for many people. They want to try and do what they can to reduce the risk of dementia and cognitive decline and some apps you know have talked about their ability to factor in to having a positive effect on dementia risk but that claim has not been supported by empirical evidence so yeah it's very precarious out there um but that's not to say that there aren't interventions and there aren't protocols um with merit there will be robust well created methodologically sound protocols but it's just really important to pick through them carefully and find out which are evidence-based and backed by research compared to which are just a little bit more, meh, somebody's developed it and dropped it onto the app store, but there's no kind of citation, there's no research backing behind it. So yeah, just, yeah, research your your brain training carefully. One thing that I always noticed in different fields, this is my sign that it's a near transfer is that it's there's like a, a reasoning that's given like oh but it improves uh, this game improves your hand-eye coordination so maybe six years later you might have improved a little bit of slightly in the game but usually when there's like a description of but your you know your vocabulary will they'll, they'll, they'll something like this will improve when they're like trying to find a reason yeah, usually yeah. there's a disconnect between that and the and it's quite seductive and you see these <clears throat> these games you know There are parents who see these apps and they think, right, I'm going to get my preschooler doing these apps. I'm going to create a genius child. And there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of sensationalizing going on around some of these claims. So you've just got to be really critical and rational with how you approach them and look for things that are evidence-based and the quality of the research. And if it's been replicated by other Um, laboratories or other universities so that also gives it more credibility that it's not just the one person who's kind of studying it over and over again but other people find similar results so yeah it's it's important to be savvy in that way also kind of links back to earlier that we are a tribe usually items that are presented like an island like this thing will help you in that small category is not the case it it should blend with the larger populace or else there's some parts of reality that are being left out in that and you're being bamboozled by some individual or company in some some way yeah if it's It's like the old adage in life if it sounds too good to be true it probably is (laughs) there's still i think a lot of merit we can take from that Mm -hmm. now Related to it, you had mentioned uh, your father had strokes and uh, the changes, mm-hmm. and I've seen changes in my other uh, friend as well, mm. but um, made me think of the what is passed down. So this one is a, kind of a two-part, but from either of your parents, what's a quality that passed down to you that you highly identify with? Mm. I'll leave it there, and then I'll do the next one as a separate part. But any key elements that you're like, that clearly passed yeah. down and that has been... That's a really interesting and cool question. So I'd say that my my dad's also, well, my mum and dad are both scientists, so they met when they were studying biology. So, um, but I see kind of those very scientific traits as very visible in my dad, like he's very uh, logical about things. So I feel like I'm, I'm also quite logical and I suspect that that may be more associated with my dad. And then with my mum, I think she's very good at, kind of caring about people um, as well as I'm sure she was a great scientist. Um, My dad tells me that she was actually better than he was when they were at university together. But what I see from her is she's incredibly caring and compassionate. Um, And I'd like to think that, you know, I occupy some of those um, qualities as well. So they would be the things I think about. 
How about you? What, what do you have? That's cool. Long live Helen Natal. And uh, that's true. By the way, how do you pronounce last name pronunciation exactly is? I, I'd go with Nuttall, but I mean, you know, however it comes out, yeah. it's fine. That's cool. Yeah, so what, what um, qualities have warm. you received from your parents? This is now the Helen show. Okay, we're switching things around. <laughs> I have, that's which is cool. Um, I would say I've received some things that come to mind is, uh, I would uh, some sort of toughness, I'll call it, from my paternal relative. Mm-hmm. And then um, a little bit of can get anything done also. And, and also like uh, uh, strong, like a, being a pillar of your own that. I would say whatever that is. Yep. And then from my maternal relative, my mom, <laughs> I like to use big words, but uh, I would say that um, good energy, uh, positive, positive spirit, like a yeah. upbeat yeah. nature yeah. and a, a vocal, I'm more vocal, but more like uh, outgoing people, oh, people oriented. Yeah, like oriented, gregarious, right? kind that of works. sociable. That sounds like a great combination of characteristics to have. So, yeah. You're a great combination of characters. <laughs> Both We're of all great combinations <laughs> of characteristics. That's We've cool. all got our individual trajectories and we all play a part in the circle of life. This is true. This is true. And also, I always, I always, I post different things once in a while, different quotes and stuff. But we are the only. What do you think about this one? Actually, I should throw in some variety of material because I like variety of material as well. What do you think about the idea that we are the only culmination of all the experiences and pieces of our existence? There's nobody that met those people, did those things, went to that place at that time. Thoughts on that? Absolutely, and that absolutely captures this idea of cognitive reserve and the idea that we need to consider individual trajectories in order to understand how people are going to age differently because you are your unique combination of life events and experiences and choices and there's only one set that you know you'll ever make and that will be unique to everyone else's yeah i totally believe in that that's cool who are some of the figures that have guided you the most along your i guess career path that come to mind or are there any that come to mind where if you didn't meet this person or that person things would have been different you'd be in a different interesting county or city or interesting different uh research so of course direction. you know family are a huge positive influence in life so my parents have been a, a great positive influence and helped to direct me um considerably there was a time in my life where i wanted to go and work in theater production um, and my, my dad said, no, <laughs> um, it was when I was at college studying kind of science, um, and I was also doing English and I was also kind of doing performing arts. And I thought, oh, I think I'll go to the West end in London, which is kind of the theater district. And I'll learn, I'll go to performing arts school and I'll learn how to produce theater, um, and shows and my my dad kind of said look it's really difficult to see. some people might view this negatively but I think it on reflection it was the right advice for me he was like that it's a really difficult kind of path and I think you'd be better you know pursuing your other courses that you're taking um because this was coming to a point where I had to drop a course so between 16 to 17 you do so many courses and you drop one and then you take those to like the final qualification when you're 18 years old so I wanted to drop chemistry and keep performing arts and he convinced me to drop performing arts and keep chemistry so I was glad that I did that um so that was good and then um I did some training at um, University College London um, after my PhD and I met two really inspirational and influential people who were my supervisors. Uh, one is Professor Patty Dank, one is Professor Joe Devlin and they both offered different but kind of complementary um, development points I guess. Like Patty taught me a lot about how to create a laboratory of people and how important um, the dynamics are between people so it's not the case that you hire the smartest person in the room which I think prior to meeting Patty I always thought that 
that's what these big academics would be doing, hiring the smartest person in the room. But actually the most beneficial thing to do is figure out, you know, what are the gaps in your lab and try to hire people who will offer complimentary, challenging views on things, you know, don't just replicate every lab member with every lab member with every lab member, but have a diverse lab because that diversity is really key to high level quality scientific discovery. Because if everybody thinks in the same way, I don't think that gets you as far as when you have those different viewpoints. Um, and then Joe was a great figure because he was incredibly, he still is very generous. So he, if an opportunity came that he thought was was valuable, he would offer that to a junior member of staff and give you a chance to explore the opportunity and allow junior members of staff to shine when if he himself had you know taken the opportunity, he could have probably done something great with it himself. So he had this view of like paying things forward. So if he said like, thank you, like for giving me that opportunity, he never wanted like gifts of thanks or thank you cards. He just wanted you to pay it forward. So like when you're the next in the, you know, the next position in your career, you think about the person junior to you and you, you pay it forwards in terms of giving somebody that opportunity and stepping back to allow somebody else to step forwards. There's some great points here on that last one. It reminds me of a quote that President Obama said, where he said, if you're in a position, if you don't pull somebody up towards where you are, then you shouldn't be where you are. Something like that. Mm. Similar yeah, exactly. If you're only interested in sort of furthering your own interests, then that maybe speaks to whether you should be in that position or not. And Joe was just a, a beacon of you know, being that leader who believed in lifting up um, his team, which was amazing to work with both of them. So they really influenced then when I went on to try and create my own group of people to work with and how I thought about it. So, yeah, I've been very there's fortunate. Difference between, to there's a person, people. Right. It's like the difference between you're on top and you're pulling the people up with you versus you're on top, like, Haha, I am on top of all of you. They're not the same. Exactly, exactly. And then I wanted to actually connect with, that's interesting, uh, the theater and that path early on closed out. You mentioned the West End. I've had guests on the show multiple times. My uh, closest individual in Glasgow, Mary Rose Mullen, she's a costume designer for Scottish Ballet, and she's on the West End of, I guess, Glasgow. And... Uh, that's why West End made me go West End. Mm -hmm. And um, that's like the alternate path. So when you were describing that, it like made me think of the uh, complete alternate path. Yeah. And then they might look at your path as like, huh. And then you might look at that end as look through it. Huh. There's like, a, they're happening at the same time. It's like a sliding uh, doors <laughs> type thing. <laughs> <laughs> they both occur. That's true. That's true. And then it, it, it speaks a little bit to like a different, um, but then there's the, the, some fields, they appear to have more creativity built in. Some fields appear to have more logic built in, but there are bits of creativity in uh, each, uh, in other. And then uh, there's logic in how you set up a theater pr production as well. For sure. And I, a I, that, it's really interesting that you say that because that's something I've also tried to, when I was making the choice to kind of commit to science, like I really thought about, about exactly that. There is still a huge amount of creativity in science. It doesn't look like the same creativity that you might find in the West End, but there is enormous creativity. And the ability to wake up one day and create research questions to then go and test, create a novel experiment to go and test that, create a new take on data that exists. There is a lot of room for creativity and innovation and then um but you don't necessarily think in those terms when you think about oh science versus yeah this career on in theater production is they're, they're very different but yeah definitely finding the creativity in different ways is a great thing to try and do they're described a certain way but when you get down to the details the details are more multifaceted than yeah because outside always individuals, I've always said this, people have to put a 
label like that's John the soccer player that's as much thought as most individuals are going to give to yeah. each thing yeah this is wonderful I would add more but that may be for a future item yeah I would like to say it has been a wonderful discussion covering speech the brain plasticity various topics Dr. Helen Nadal, I would like to thank you for having joined on this episode of the show, potentially on for a future show, and bringing a lot of knowledge and great descriptions to all of us. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me for the engaging conversation. It's been a pleasure to discuss all these topics with you. Definitely be happy to make a return appearance one day, should you find a, a show that might be you know, interesting for us to connect on. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for your time and, and listening to what I've got to say. I appreciate it. Cheers to that. And we are out.